right. Hi. All right. Hello. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, today's topic is less is more or large scale scrum through the eyes of the Red Hat in vehicle operating system. In other words, welcome to the least technical automotive talk here at DEF CONF. <laughs> so before we get kicked off, I want to take a second to introduce ourselves. My name is Allison King and I am a technical project manager within the Red Hat in vehicle operating system team. I joined the team a little over two years ago when the program was really just beginning its wild, wild west phase. And I'll talk a little more about that in a little while. But I am a uh, Jira love hater, just like Lucy had mentioned in the last presentation. And I thrive on finding better ways for teams to work together and to help them thrive. I'm also a sucker for a good dad joke, so I apologize in advance for any puns in this presentation. They're definitely intended and do not feel obligated to laugh. You can cringe. I'm used to it. The team knows. We'll turn it over to Sabina. All right. Yeah, so I'm Sabina Fogel. I also joined a little more than two years ago, actually one week after Allison. So she helped me onboarding. <laughs> um, I'm working as a senior agile practitioner in the automotive initiative in the Red Hat in vehicle operating system. And um, my passion is to support people to become great team members and contributing and, and growing. Um, so I, I love to help people and I think the co-creation and co collaboration is the key to success. And um, as part of my job, I see making myself redundant is the most important thing. So it's not about me, it's always about the team and the team members I'm working with. Right. So talking about the team members we work with, Together with some other project managers, including Satya, who is here in the audience today, program managers and agile practitioners, Sabina and I are members of the autopilots. And the autopilots are the agile-focused cross-functional program team within the Red Hat in-vehicle operating system. We chose that name pretty deliberately early on to not call ourselves a team of scrum masters because our roles go far beyond that. Our roles and responsibilities are very fluid and they change as the program changes. And that's really been key for us in helping to provide a culture of collaboration and continuous improvement across the organization. So I'm gonna ask everybody to buckle up real quick. I'm gonna take you on a journey today. First, it's the program inception, the why and how of the Red Hat in vehicle operating system. From here, we'll take you through the wild, wild west and talk a little bit about how things started and why it was important to find structure. And then once we found that structure, how we've used that to get to a bit of a more steady state within the automotive program. From here, we'll give you a sneak peek into some key activities and decisions that we feel are really important regardless of the team that you're supporting or the framework or structure you're using. And we'll send you home with some road trip goodies in the form of learnings. So our goal at the end of this presentation is one, that everybody is still awake, and two, that regardless if you have realized that less is best for your team, that you understand there are other frameworks out there, and there's already patterns that exist in the industry that are really well documented to help you wrangle your teams into a more steady state. So if you're looking at this presentation thinking, I like some of it, but not all of it, don't feel like it's all or nothing. You can choose, pick and choose what you want and maybe find another framework that fits you a little bit better. So let's hop in our DeLorean. Why automotive? Back in 2021, the automotive or the Red Hat leadership team found a market need and they thought that a Linux based operating system would be really well received in the automotive industry because Linux and cars, I mean, that was the only reason. I joke. They really had a vision. And by vision, I mean there was a business objective, and that was to provide a functional, safe, certified Linux operating system that was based on RHEL. So it was a really, really great idea, and we're continuing to develop toward it today. But when that vision came out, there was no structure to achieve it. And that's where the autopilots came in. You know, when I say there was no structure, when Sabina and I started, there were 200 engineers that were coming in from different programs, different companies, different industries. And 
this team of engineers was tasked with doing something that had never been done before. And that was to develop a new operating system based on Linux that was functional safe certified. And you know, I want you guys to picture what this looked like for us. If you think about all of the people that were on the tram with you on the way in today, just think about that tram, you know, hundreds of people on there and somebody coming on and saying, hey, this is now your team. You guys are tasked with building something that's never been done before and just go ahead and do it, get started. Pretty uncomfortable, probably a lot of questions and you're probably yearning for some structure. And that's really what we came in looking at. It was pure chaos. And we really wanted to find a way to get to a more steady state. So how did we start? We started with some principles. We knew it was important to establish a collaborative culture. And we knew that we needed to have a set of principles that would guide us there. So everything that we talk about here today is based on these principles that were assumed over two years ago now but still lay the foundation for everything we do. Right, and then the next layer was, okay, so what is the, the guardrails that would lead us and also provide a structure and clarity, but still be flexible enough for us to scale and try things out and use different tools. So just the gate wall, guardrails, not a predefined corset, so that, that was important. And then as we expand out to the next layer on this, we get to guides. So building a complex operating system, we needed a set of guides, some tips, tricks, tools to help people. It's really similar to a map. I know people don't really use those anymore, but you know, back in the day when you used to print those out with the pictures and the words and it would tell you how to get there, we've adopted, we've, we've moved forward in time. We used GPS, but we wanted to give our teams a GPS. We wanted to give them the tools they needed to succeed and to make their day-to-day -day easier. Yeah, and in, in order to scale and make it really long-lived, we wanted to create an environment of, um, for improvement, exploration, and innovation. And so that is the thing that keeps us driving and, and it's continuous learning. And we've heard that in several sessions already. And uh, yeah, that's also our goal, of course. And so a couple of slides ago, I had mentioned our principles. You know, as the autopilots had started their journey through the Tuckman's five stages, we were storming, forming, norming, and we were spending daily meetings observing what the teams were doing, observing some of the, the issues that the teams are trying to solve and trying to find ways for them to collaborate better. And in doing so, we were able to establish a core set of principles. The first one being, we needed a way to bring people together to collaborate. Being 200 people from all over the place being brought together, we needed to foster an environment of collaboration, help define that team feeling, help people feel comfortable and ready to talk to each other, ready to communicate, and, and really ready to work together. We also knew that these 200 people were not always gonna be 200 people. We knew this team was going to grow and we needed a to find a way to scale with intention. Also, I mentioned functional safety a couple of times. We knew that there couldn't be silos. Functional safety relies on a culture of safety. It's not just a single team. Safety mindset has to run through the blood of the organization. So for this reason, plus the reason of collaboration, we knew we couldn't have any silos in the organization. And last but not least, being a first to market product, Putting the customer at the forefront of what we were doing early and often was more important than ever. We needed to find ways to build confidence in the customers and help deliver early and often and let them see what we were doing so we can iterate and adapt. And then, you know, that's really where it left us to take this road toward less. Exactly. So we were based on, basing from our deliverables, right? We, and we wanted to understand what, we understood what the needs were, and so we were looking out for a framework. Uh, there are plenty of frameworks out there, um, from very complex ones to very simple ones, and most important for us was the flexibility. So it needed to be flexible. Then also, uh, what less, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so what less provides us is a very cu uh, customer-centric view. 
that is important, as Alison said before, um, then it does foster continuous improvement and it drives system thinking and a whole product view. So it's not just one segment, it's, it's really the, the whole picture, that's the next bullet. And um, we can scale it with intention. So less is scaled Scrum and therefore it is, you can just use Scrum for one team, but you can then build your teams up. And I mean, Alison said we onboarded 200 people not from the very beginning, right? We had fewer people, but then we had to create the structure in order to be able to scale. But you ensure that when you start, you, you don't full, you don't put the whole blown framework over an organization that might not be existing yet. So you build it up piece by piece. So that was very easy with, with less. And it helped us also, especially since we're using features team um, based, based in, in the organization. So we could scale. Less is very flexible. It's very easy to understand because many, many teams already know Scrum um, and therefore it was easy to adapt. So, you know, we want to take you to something a little more tangible now. So what Sabina had just covered is why we chose Less and some of the benefits. But what does this actually look like in practice? So in Less, there is a chief product owner a lot of times on the framework diagrams, it'll be referred to as a CPO. Don't confuse that with C3PO, um, Star Wars. I do know, though, they bear a lot of similarities. The chief product owner is responsible for translating the customer's desired outcomes into meaningful work for the engineering teams. And the chief product owner collaborates with the area product owners. So as Samita mentioned, we are a feature area-based organization. Each feature area is responsible for delivering a specific set of features to the customer. Each of these feature areas has their own dedicated product owner who collaborates with that chief product owner to develop their, you know, their feature set and be able to deliver what's meaningful at the right time for the customer. The feature areas are then further broken down into feature teams. These feature teams there's usually two to six within a specific feature area. But what's really, really cool about these feature teams is they are inclusive of all the disciplines that are necessary to deliver an end-to-end -end increment of software at the end of a sprint. A lot of words. What does that mean? That means that QE, docs, perf and scale, tool chain, et cetera, all of these cross-collaboration teams that are really responsible for the end-to-end -end integration are embedded within the feature teams. So at the end of a sprint, a demo, that team can actually demo an, a working piece of software. And that's really, really important for us because now we can deliver to our customer early and often. Yeah, and uh, Allison already mentioned our feature teams, uh, not all of them, but uh, we provide you an insight into our organization, so don't tell anyone. <laughs> So we have seven feature feature teams, and uh, they, you can call them randomly. You know, you can also call them Mickey Mouse or whatever you like, and or herding cats. So that's a cat team. That's a dog's team. So uh, that really isn't important. But you might have heard already um, some talks here from Containers on Wheels people, and um, as Allison mentioned, these feature teams do have a product owner of their own. And we do have the teams comprised of, of all these uh, cross-functional layers as well. So we are not just five people in a team. We are more people. So we have people also, especially from documentation in the teams. So delivering end-to-end, -end, but also documenting <laughs> the pieces right away. And um, then on the left-hand side, we have the chief product owner who interacts with all of the product owners of those feature teams. Um, the cross-collaboration teams also have product owners. That might be a specialty, but this is how we set it up, just to ensure that these teams are also aligned cross-functional and cross across the teams. Then on, on the right-hand side, we've put the autopilot, so it's, it's Allison and, and my team. Uh, to ensure that we work with all of the teams. We really support in 
tool development, in enablement, in onboarding, so basically everything what's needed. And again, that's why we didn't call ourselves Scrum Masters, because that would be just too located for a team. And um, we really helped onboarding those teams and setting them up in the, in the beginning so that they would get into the cadence of how Scrum works, how, how the organization works. Uh, we also have a community layer who um, ensures that we we work with the, with the community, and we have the automotive management structure also, and they ensure that they take care of the team individuals, helping them to overcome obstacles and, and remove roadblocks. So they're not necessarily members of the teams, um, because we want to ensure that the teams do take ownership and become self-sufficient working teams. And the prioritization is also done by the product owners and the chief product owner. All right. So, uh, sorry, I'm click happy. It's the Czech coffee. It's a lot stronger than American coffee. I can't stop clicking, so <laughs> I apologize. Uh, the infrastructure we are talking about here, you know, we're starting first and foremost with a unified backlog. This unified backlog is really the culmination of the conversations the chief product owner has with the customer, as well as the feature areas and the feature area product owners. What we talk about here today, this is our hierarchy, and we're using JIRA as our issue management tracking system, but I do want to highlight that LESS is very flexible. It actually does not specify which tools you can use, so what we share can be tweaked, and it could also translate to any other issue tracking center. So if you're using GitHub or anything, you can take this with you as well. So, you know, like I said, we're using the unified backlog. Great, we understand what the strategy is. We understand what the customer wants, but how are we going to deliver that? What are we going to deliver? Specifically, what we are going to deliver are the features to the customer. This, the features are the point of collaboration across our feature areas, and from here, the feature areas are able to break down the work into epics. And these epics are the point of collaboration within a feature area. So whereas the feature spans across the entire organization, epics tend to be a little more focused on a specific feature area. And an epic is a unit of work that's usually one to two sprints. Um, in normal people terms, it's two to four weeks. And that's, you know, that's really where the collaboration happens within a team. The teams are then able to break down the epics further into tasks and stories. A task and story is a single delivery owner within the, ep the uh, feature area that is defined in the epic. And those can usually be delivered within a sprint, one to two tasks or stories per sprint, depending on your team's capacity and how you're story pointing. Well, actually not really how you're story pointing because that doesn't matter. I don't know why I said that, to be totally honest. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll turn it to Sabina. Thank you. Yeah, so now we've taken you on the journey. It was how do we onboard the first new people? How do we scale? How do we understand what is needed? Uh, pick a framework, put that in place, bring people into the structure, showing you the structure, how we are set up. Um, also, as, as teams grow, and I, I forgot to mention that before, but if a feature area grows, I mean, that means you're not growing the team indefinitely, right? Because then you need to break them out into smaller teams within that feature area. Um, so you can decide whether you want to have a product owner of their own or it's that main product owner and you have um, sub-teams within that area. Um, so that's a matter of scaling, right? And then you have in Scrum, the Scrum, Scrum of Scrum, what we have in less here with the chief product owner. So we, we have two layers, the, the team layers and the product owners, and we have the product owners creating a team of them themselves, right? Um, but in order to ensure that it's long lived, um, in Scrum and also in less, we have the continuous improvement cycles. So at the end of each sprint, we do have a retrospective. And since we do have two week sprints, we have so many opportunities during a year to improve ourselves, um, but to make sure that we only take tiny steps. Yeah, that's important. Also what Ilania said, we don't over 
don't stress the people out with too many changes at once, right? Don't change big items every two weeks, but make sure to tackle the ones that are really needed. So the first item that was like the most important thing uh, is to have a stop <laughs> having items tracked in multiple places. And you probably know that as well, right? So you start uh, documenting things and you, different people have different preferences. So one person would start documenting in a GDoc, other person would start uh, documenting in Confluence. And so you have multiple places and data documents get outdated and there's nothing worse than outdated documentation. <laughs> so we, that's like the core thing. Stop doing this, define and agree on one single source. Um, that's also why we, we initiated Jira. Um, so that's the documentation piece. Then when you continue um, starting, if we hadn't already started with a team of autopilots, we definitely would have started one because it's really helpful to ensure that we are talking in a consisting and in one voice to the organization. The organization has multiple people to go to in different time zones. So you, you have a continuous flow also to interact with the people and to collaborate and support the teams moving on. And as said before, it's the unified backlog because you have so many different areas, it's important to have one source so that you are not losing the team out on where they're going towards. And it also provides a very good overview for the product owners in their conversations for prioritization. Because what happens in, in our area is that engineers from other feature teams need to help out in a certain area where you have a lot of demand right away. So balancing this and knowing that there is a need then the, the other product owners can decide, okay, so we're gonna help out and we're gonna take work on to get you through that bottleneck so that we then all can go back into our areas and continue working. Um, continuously growing <laughs> with the automotive team across functions and organizations. Um, as you have new people onboarding, you need to reevaluate what you're doing and if something doesn't work, you need to need to fix it. Um, and continuous improvement, uh, going Jira only. It's the same thing. New people, you constantly need to to onboard people. You need to explain why you're doing things the way you do. And if you experience well, the way we do it doesn't really make sense. Then you need to also be open and change it so that it does uh, also meet the the ongoing needs. Same with team empowerment. Whatever is not working, you need to listen to your, your team members. You need to engage them. Otherwise, any change will fail because the team will be resistant. And um, the last bullet point is, is about um, onboarding documentation and, and keeping up with the changes. That's very critical and uh, continues to improve our documentation. I think that's, yeah. All right, so um, now we would like to present you with our journey suites um, for your potential journey. And it's basically a summary of, of all what I said before. So when you get into the situation of, of introducing a new framework uh, or a new type of work, so please make sure that you do understand your needs, that you really take time to look at what there is and, and not just take a pick a framework because you heard from somebody it's nice or cool or uh, that's the state of the art right now. It did work for a different company, a different culture. So please make sure that you start small from your own framework. <laughs> so we did pick, le uh, pick less and we also provided you a link to less. And uh, keep in mind to to make sure that you're working only on one backlog, so it's either single backlog called or unified backlog, whatever you want to call it, but just make sure it's one source and everybody knows where it is and, and that they contribute to, the, to it. Um, have a standard method for tracking. Uh, in, it, in our case, it was Jira. If you have another tool that you really love and know that it's working for you, go ahead and do that. 
And um, last but not least, we are really advocating for an autopilot team <laughs> as servant leaders to the organization because we receive positive feedback that it really helps the organization grow and become stable. And that was it. Thank you very much for listening. And, uh, <laughs>
and helping teams understand that the framework is actually flexible and can work for them, not against them, is you know another struggle to follow up on the other question. Yeah, and if I may add to that, um, in the previous session, people were asked um, how many people were left after mm -hmm. that form formation, right? Um, we are about 200 people, and I know that we had three or four changes so far within the last one and a half to two years. So I think that is a very low attrition rate. And yeah, so surprised, I think people are, no matter all the uncertainty and ambiguity, I think we did manage it quite well so far. And I hope that we're getting more stable, of course. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah, one thing you didn't talk about, which, because uh, my team also is working in the less framework, we find it really powerful with the six week demo cycle and the goal setting that's part of the framework. I wondered if you wanted to talk about that because I think it, it helps with the resistor team. People, people see the success uh, almost immediately, whereas some of the frameworks maybe don't give that. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah, so the question was uh, we didn't emphasize on the six weeks um, demo and, and, and so second layer sprint, right? Yeah. Um, correct, we didn't do that. So we didn't lay out the, the less framework in total here. I th we thought it would be too long and, and probably a bit more complicated. But yes, that's exactly the, the point. You have the flexibility of building it. And there you have every three sprints. In our case, it's three sprints. So it's every six weeks. You have a demo of, of the organization, so to say. Um, so every two weeks you have your, your sprint and your demo at the end in the feature teams individually and then every six weeks you bring it together. So that really helps the organization also to see what the other teams are doing and, and linking it back to the unified backlog, you know, what is it that we are working on. Yes, that is very powerful. So thank you very much for mentioning that. Yeah, and to, to build on Sabina's response there too is bringing everybody together to see First of all, what the other teams are working on, it does foster collaboration, it breaks down silos, but on top of that, it really does help give meaning to the work. So I think, you know, Sabina had touched on the low attrition rate. Teams being able to see what their work is doing and how it interacts with the bigger picture, like this demo is recorded and presented to our product management team every week, or every six weeks. And for them to be able to see their work rolling up into what's going to be a release, is really meaningful and keeping them engaged in the morale up through those demos is something that we find extreme value in. Okay, so the question is how, so the chief product owner in some cases is referred to as a mini CEO. So how are we engaging the chief product owner in the teams to get their feedback and to really create that environment um, and give them, but still giving the teams the autonomy and freedom to do what they're doing, is that correct? <laughs> I will use them because I don't know who, who is that person. Uh, and I believe he has a lot to say uh, when it comes to feature planning. So I, I would assume um, there needs to be some kind of support or information for or authority to this role. So how how does it work in Ottoman? Like, have you restructured um, to give this person um, the autonomy? So the question is, how do we give the chief product owner the autonomy they need and get the teams engaged? Mm -hmm. Well, the 
first off is that six weeks demo is really, really important to showcasing what, what has been done. But the chief product owner in our case is very, very close to the customer. There are multiple meetings per week with different engineering teams and different levels um, of program management and architects with the customer themselves. So they understand at the very high and low level what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. So by having that credibility, it makes it a lot easier for them to come back to the teams and say, hey, the customer would like to see this. And then on top of that, having you know a certification that we're, we're working toward, there's a lot of requirements that they're um, you know, coming to us with that you know, are just hard requirements. So we try and give them the, the freedom and let them be involved in the process, uh, but very, very happy to have, have their feedback and have their close tie-in with the customer. So we are out of time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.